Right, so we're back for part three, and as you can see, it's a lot colder now. I've thought about it a lot, and the more I look through their squad, the more I just really wanted to manage Norway. Erling Haaland is obviously the top draw, but we've also got Christopher Ayer, Sanderberg, and Martin Erdegaard. Plus, some of the less established players look frankly ridiculous as well, like Hauger, Evgen, and Jorgensen. It's sad to leave New Zealand, but this is the challenge and journey after all. Not that we're likely to win a World Cup with Norway, but if we can make the World Cup at all, it'll be great, and if not, it's just a fun excursion before the inevitable mass sackings afterwards. Two games have already been played in their World Cup qualification group under the previous manager, losing to Austria, but then beating England, so maybe this is actually doable after all. Now already I can see a higher level of expectation here, as four journalists turn up to the opening press conference, and the press officer says that this isn't many. In New Zealand we had one guy the entire time. And this is a major promotion, all the way up to 33rd in the rankings. That's like being hired by a championship side straight from the Valorama National League which I don't think has happened too much. I tried to find some examples of that, but couldn't, but I did find that Steve Cottrell took Cheltenham from the Vanarama National League South to League One, left to manage Stoke in the Championship, but then quit after 13 games to become the assistant manager at Sunderland. I mean, why the hell would anyone do that? Anyway, New Zealand moved quickly to replace us, hiring Regen Colin Harris. I mean, look at those attributes. All I can say is good luck, Colin. And then both Mexico and the USA successfully got knocked out of the Gold Cup in the quarterfinals somehow with Costa Rica winning the final on penalties over Martinique, a team who don't even have a FIFA ranking because they're not actually a member of FIFA or even a country, they're considered to be part of France. So first we've got the Euros being won by greyed out players and now this, although amazingly neither of their managers is sacked for doing worse than a team who are not even allowed to enter the World Cup, so I think we still made the right choice. So anyway, let's try and qualify for the World Cup, shall we? Our first game is against Luxembourg, which is about as good a start as you could hope for, Christopher Ayer is annoyingly injured, but otherwise it's the lineup I think is the strongest, albeit increasing in quality going further forwards. And it doesn't take long to score our first goal as Newcastle's Jonas Svensson cuts out a sloppy goal kick, finds Mohamed El Yanusi, who feeds Erling Haaland to score hopefully his first of many. Martin Odegaard is heavily involved throughout and nearly scores from this mazy run, and then in the second half Erling Haaland really should double the lead with this chance. But that's it, it's a 1-0 win against Luxembourg. I mean not the most inspiring of starts, but it's still 3 points. We then play Austria in a must-win game if we have any ambition of qualifying at all, and we make a flying start as Bergemelling plays a crossing from the left for Mohamed El Yunusi to knock down for Morton Thorsby to smash home. And then not long after, Martin Odegaard puts in a corner for Erling Haaland to fall over the ball into the net for two. On the hour mark, Valentino Lazaro brings down Bergemelling for a penalty, which Haaland of course converts. In the second half, we have more chances to extend the lead, but it ends 3-0, which I will take all day long. What a win. We're up to second in the group with that, the playoffs are now very much a possibility. Our next qualifier sees us travel to Israel and it's a cagey affair, but a free kick from Martin Odegaard is headed home by now fit Christopher Raya for another vital win. That's before a dominant 3-0 friendly win over Russia. Austria then draw 1-1 with England to leave us in an extremely strong position with three games left. All three will be played in a bumper November. We go to Wembley to play England knowing that getting anything from the game will be a huge boost. 14 minutes in and some excellent work from Erling Haaland finds Martin Odegaard who slides in Mohamed El Yanusi to fire past Nick Pope. We've got a shock lead but I'm not sure it's going to last. Marcus Rashford casts through our defence before blazing over before an excellent ball from Harry Kane gives him another chance. And that was just a warning as another run from Rashford sees Jonas Svensson bring him down for a penalty. Harry Kane steps up but he sees his efforts saved by Andre Hansen. Are we actually going to pull this off? A few minutes later a clearance from Harry Maguire only finds Sanderberg who offloads to Berger Melling on the left who slips in Jens Peter Hauger to beat Pope at his near post. Straight from kickoff England have another chance only for Mason Mount to hit the post and at half time we're somehow 2-0 up at Wembley. Look at that XG. It surely can't last though right? Early in the second half Rashford runs through once again and sets up Mason Mount to score but it's ruled out for offside. We then have a goal of our own ruled out for some reason and with time running out Harry Kane is clean through but once again Hansen saves. And then Deli Ali is clean through as well only for Ayer to put in a tackle of the century and then that is it. We somehow held on to beat England 2-0 at Wembley. Even if we'd lost, we'd still have qualified if we beat Israel and Luxembourg, but now we only need a point because Austria have drawn their game. Boris Johnson, can you hear me? Your boys have taken a hell of a beating. It's a packed house in Oslo as we're on the verge of history a few days later. A great cross from Svensson brings this incredible finish from Erdegaard to open the scoring. Israel do work a decent move and Manistaba brings them level. And then shortly after El Yanusi hits the post, Israel take the lead through a deflection off Christopher Ayer. It would be typical of me to somehow muck this up from here. In the second half, El Yanusi is fouled in the box though and Haaland steps up to equalise from the spot. And then in injury time, Bergamelling fires a corner in for Josh King to head home to restore our lead. 
before being put through by Stephanie Hansen to seal the game and qualification for the World Cup for the first time since 1998. Pack your flip-flops boys, we're off to Qatar. The second string then proceeds to draw 1-1 with the 10-man Luxembourg, but it means absolutely nothing. We've done it, England squeak into the playoffs, but it's absolute carnage elsewhere as Italy, Denmark and Spain all fail to qualify outright. I mean, obviously lots of top teams are still here, but have we actually got a chance? I'll see you in a year, or actually maybe not, because we've still got the Nations League, so I guess we'll just do that now as well. Flash forward a few months later to March and the playoffs have happened and for some reason Italy and Denmark were just allowed in them anyway but uh, well Italy still didn't qualify so it's two World Cups in a row without the Azuri. England do manage to qualify though. In April we get the Nations League draw. We've got World Cup failures Italy, Holland and Scotland which is pretty tough but after what we just managed you have to be optimistic right? We start off against Scotland, hopeful of three points to kick things off. And we start well as Mohamed El Yunusi plays an excellent pass over the Scottish defence for Erling Haaland to score a goal which can only be described as absolute filth. But the lead only lasts five minutes as a poor pass from Jonas Svensson results in Linton Dykes being free to slide past new goalkeeper Christopher Klaassen. And then things get even worse as Andy Robertson crosses for Ollie McBurney to head home. But then it's straight down the other end and good work from Martin Odegaard allows El Yunusi to set up Haaland for his second. And then in the second half we get a boost to score. Scott McTominay is given a straight red card for hacking down El Yunusi. And then it's not long before Haaland heads in a corner to complete another hat-trick and give us an excellent comeback win. A great start, but now we have to play Holland. We may only be in episode 3, but we have actually covered two full seasons of time and at this point we've actually somehow only lost one match and that was a friendly to Iceland with New Zealand. But that may well be about to change. 20 minutes in and Holland go close as Myron Badu hits the post and then shortly after they score as Klaassen, who I've accidentally still left in the team instead of Andre Hansen, who it turns out is much better, gets caught in no man's land by Daniel Marlin, who slots home. Straight from the restart though, we work an opportunity, which eventually comes to Mohamed El Yunusi to fire home the equaliser. But almost immediately, Frankie de Jong boots the ball downfield for Marlin to grab his second. We chase an equaliser, but instead they get a third as De Ligt heads home from a corner. And we lose, for the first time as Norway manager, and only the second time in the save. Still, there's no shame in losing to the Netherlands, I suppose, with the players that they've got, but then they lose to Italy, and they've just lost to Scotland, so I don't really know. The World Cup draw happens, and we're in part three. Group H is the result, France, Nigeria, and Australia which I'd say we have a good chance with, at least in terms of getting second place. And just to check, New Zealand did not qualify for the World Cup. They lost to Colombia, and it's safe to say things have gone terribly under Colin. World Cup failures Italy are up next, and considering they just lost to Scotland, as well as failing to qualify for the World Cup, we might actually be the favourites for this. It's overall a pretty uneventful game though, and the only highlight of the first half sees Jens Peter Hauga fire over, and then in the second, Erling Haaland misses, but was offside anyway. And then Italy's first highlight of the entire game sees Chiro Mobile score to give them a 1-0 win. We then play Scotland a few weeks later, and the exact same thing happens. Barely any highlights, we miss a great chance, and then they score with their only highlight of the game. I mean, fair enough Holland and Italy, but we just lost to Scotland. How exactly did we manage to qualify for the World Cup a few months ago? We play Holland again, and we need a good performance at least, and we don't get one because we're 2-0 down within 10 minutes. We do at least score a goal for the first time in ages through Haaland, but then Memphis Depay makes it 3-1, so that's great. Our final match is against Italy, and if we lose, we're relegated, so it's excellent that Nicolo Zaniolo scores within 30 seconds. We work a great chance, which Martin Odegaard can somehow only hit the post with. I decide to go attacking because I am not getting relegated over Scotland, and we actually manage to score as Bergamelling finds Morton Thorsby to head in. And in the second half, we work an amazing chance with Martin Odegaard smashing home, only for it to be ruled out for offside for some reason. Apparently Hauger is offside, which one, he isn't, and two, why the hell does it even matter? He's not interfering with play. Did they bribe the VARF with a case of iron brew? And then as we press forward for the winner that we definitely deserve, Italy hits on the counter and Castrovelli gives them the lead. Ugh, I really do hate this game sometimes. And that is the joy of international management summed up in one 10 minute video. We go from managing to qualify for the World Cup over England to being relegated from the Nations League thanks to Scotland. You know what, I'm absolutely delighted to be heading into the World Cup on a five match losing streak. It's just what we need. I'll see you next time.